Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I'll tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories down in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, HOA finds me because I have a wheelchair on my private land, which is not even a part of their HOA. About a year ago, I became the owner of my new home. This is an area that I would describe as the outskirts of the HOA. My land, although very close to the HOA, is not part of the HOA. As you can already understand, I had conflicts with the HOA often. Even too often. It's important for you to know one more detail. I have health problems, so I have to use a wheelchair. I don't like this word, but I am actually disabled. And I'm very heavy, but I can walk with crutches and it's not the best feeling. So a wheelchair really is the best thing for me. As soon as I moved in, my family made arrangements with the right people and I got ramps. You wouldn't believe it, but this was the first reason for conflict with the HOA. They didn't like me driving through their neighborhood and spoiling the road they had been building for so long, almost at their own expense. For some reason, they had the idea that my wheelchair spoiled their road more than the loaded trucks that, for some reason, consistently passed through our neighborhood several times a week, even though it was forbidden. And I heard from several people that the head of the HOA, the so-called boss, allowed these truckers to do this for money, even though it was prohibited, not only because it was a residential area, but also because their own road surface, which they are so protective of, cannot withstand the weight of these trucks. It's a miracle that the road hasn't started to crumble too much yet, although some parts of it were breaking off, and of course, they blamed me and my wheelchair. But still, we installed the ramps and it made life much easier. I received a few fines because of this ramp, but I just ignored them. The HOA didn't really focus on the fines either because I kept seeing all of the leaders of the HOA and they all smiled hypocritically at me and didn't say a word about the fines. This is actually a very common thing in this HOA. They can say anything behind your back, but when you see them in person and talk to them, they just pretend to be your best friends. But then something got to them, and they began to openly oppose me using the wheelchair in front of them. They were even confused when I was on my own land and using my wheelchair when I was not part of this HOA and was not restricted by any bylaws from this HOA. It just got to the point where they demonstratively covered their eyes with their hands when I was in pain, and with the help of my family went on crutches to take my wheelchair from the garage. Day X came when my eldest son went home, went to the store, and accidentally overheard the head of the HOA talking about me to another neighbor while they were picking up groceries. Their dialogue was about me being an a-hole, in short, but I'll now try to convey the essence of the dialogue to you a little more accurately. You know what kind of broken phone this is, but I want you to understand the essence of the conversation at least a little bit. The chairman of the HOA will be B because he's the boss. For some reason, I find it very funny when someone calls him that. The neighbor will be J because his name starts with this letter. B. This a-hole really pissed me off. I hate it when people like him think they have rights. J. What rights does he have? If he doesn't even have the rights to go further than 50 feet into the yard without a wheelchair... They both laugh at this point. B, why the heck is he even using that thing on wheels? He has no right to do that. J, write him a ticket for it, because honestly, it's really cheapening us. Then my son came over and told me about it, and a few hours later, I received a fine for keeping things on my property that are prohibited by the moral standards of the HOA. And many more fines because of one thing. My wheelchair. They started telling me more to my face what they thought about me and my life. They didn't realize that this only played into my hands. I recorded all of our dialogues on a dictaphone. Many neighbors who were sane saw our verbal conflicts. So I contacted my lawyers and they made the necessary procedures. You should have seen the faces of these leaders of the HOA when they received the notification that they would have to go to court and came to my yard. Unfortunately, they started saying even more bad things about me behind my back and to my face. But the court changed everything. At first, we really thought that we would not win the case and that we were going to leave with nothing. 
The courts were very long, but eventually we won against the HOA. And their faces were nothing short of ridiculous when they saw their court notices. The chairman of the HOA started apologizing profusely. And it was so funny because I know what he's really thinking this whole time. But he just realized everything and didn't really want the HOA to pay a $278,000 regulatory fee. But who's asking him? Now, he's not the chairman of the HOA anymore, and there are ramps and other auxiliary things for the disabled all around the perimeter of the HOA. I'd say we won this game. The next story is, Sales manager was annoying, so I revealed all of his secrets to my superiors. We essentially sold services to businesses while I was working for a B2B sales organization, and this company managed to employ the most inept, slothful, and envious sales manager I've ever met. Five salespeople made up our team, and while we all detested our sales manager for different reasons, we liked her personality. I was the team's best salesperson, having reached 170% of my yearly goal and being close to joining the President's Club. This is partly due to the fact that I was the only salesperson on the team with relevant experience, and the sales manager lacked the skills necessary to effectively train a staff. So I was called in first when my vice president arrived for our annual performance reviews. It was Mrs. B, also known as B, and my VP. I anticipated receiving a favorable performance review, but Mrs. B immediately confronts me with the statement, Sting, you know our location hasn't been performing at objective for a number of years, and we suspect this is because salespeople are lying about their daily work. I respond, Sting, I don't believe you're doing what you claim to be doing in your CRM, and this could result in your termination. I asked, really? As I turned to face Mrs. B, I replied, I'm shocked you chose to go this route to her. Yeah. We must take whatever steps are necessary to bring this site on target, Mrs. B stated with her self-assured smile. Okay, let's play a game, I said. Pick any day in the CRM, Mrs. B, and allow me to show you that I attended all of my appointments and completed all my stops exactly as they were noted. Okay, Sting, though I'm not saying you never work in the field, I do believe there are some days when you remain in and enter BS notes into the CRM. I said, Mrs. B, choose any day you believe I lied about my sales activities. Mrs. B then chooses a day. Right now, I'm effing heated and grinning ear to ear. The VP is just looking at me with a smile and his head tilted to one side. I had a sneaking suspicion that he knew Mrs. B was about to get completely owned, and he was correct. I then asked the vice president, Mr. VP, are you aware of how Android phones work? After she gives me the day. The VP replies, educate me. I replied, since I always have my phone with me, let's compare what Google says I did that day to what my CRM says. By default, Android has location services enabled, and in reality, Google will track where you go and when. Then, surprise, surprise, there's a match when I check my Google location services for that day. Mrs. B is clearly quite worried right now. I remarked, Mrs. B, let's choose another day. I'm actually quite enjoying this performance review. Mrs. B responds, that's unnecessary. I said, Mr. VP, would you mind picking a day? I ask as I turn to face him. Sure, what about... XYZ, he responds. While I pull up my location services for that day, he pulls up my CRM. What's this? It matches. When I ask, Mr. VP, do you remember company XYZ with a contract value of over $1 million that we lost recently? I'm getting ready to use the big sticks here. Sting, yeah, I recall that supposedly our rival won them over on pricing. Can't please everyone. Mr. VP, please find attached an email from their VP essentially stating that they've decided not to work with us as a result of our failure to provide three samples for them to determine which product worked best for them. Sting, can you forward that to me? Sure. Not a problem, Mr. VP. So I send it over there. Mr. VP, well, while I'm at it, allow me to provide you with a few email chains from before this when I explicitly asked Mrs. B to get those samples, and in those very same email threads, she acknowledges having done so. I forwarded those emails to him, as per his request. Okay, Mr. VP, no orders had been placed for those samples, so I asked our service department to see whether any had. I'm going to look into this, he declares. The fact that my performance review has now become Mrs. B's performance review, and things aren't going as well as Mrs. B initially thought, 
She's currently sweating like a mother effing bullet. Mr. VP, do you mind if I go outside for a moment so that I may show you something else I'd want to bring to your attention? Sure, I need to speak with Mrs. B anyhow, he replies. No relations between management and people who work for them. It's immediate termination for the manager, is the company's very explicit policy. Joe was now a different sales consultant working in the office. Mrs. B had a thing for Joe, who was married and had two gorgeous children. Joe, I think it's time we get a new sales manager. You got those texts? I asked as I entered the sales office. When he sees me, he asks, Is today gonna be the day? I proclaimed, Today is gonna be the day. The sales team as a whole was aware of what was happening, and the workplace atmosphere improved instantly. When the location manager, who was not involved in the performance assessment, spotted Joe and I and said, What's going on? Joe replied, I'm walking back to the conference room. You'll soon require the services of a new sales manager. The site manager was perplexed when he announced that he would be entering the meeting. We agreed. This was fine. I ring the doorbell and Mr. VP invited me inside after I knocked. Joe, the site manager, and I were just standing there. Mrs. B was fully aware of what was about to occur. As we all sat down, I asked the VP, Mr. VP, I just want to make sure I understand a corporate policy. Sure. Is it true that if a manager tried to have a relationship with a direct report that the manager would be fired immediately? Mr. VP says, Yes, if something like that came to my attention, my hands would be tied. I'd have to fire the manager while sitting up straight. Joe wants to show you something, I remarked. Mrs. B stood up and left the meeting room. You could tell she was about to cry. She had just had her world, her career, completely destroyed, and I don't think she wanted to see it through. Joe continued by telling the VP that, despite being happily married with two adorable children, that Mrs. B kept trying to make advances towards him. And when Mr. VP requested to see the texts, Joe gave them to him. Joe said that he'll transmit the screenshots that the VP requested that he take. When the location manager and I need to talk, I'm going to require both of you to return to the sales office, the VP remarked. As we enter the sales office once more, I discover that the sales manager's office has been wiped out. Apparently, Mrs. B was having a bad day because she was inconsolable, sobbing, and announcing that she was leaving for home. Joe just chuckled and remarked, Yeah, she's not coming back. The VP asked me to return to the conference room after about 20, 25 minutes when she entered the sales office. So I did. And the VP came over as I was sitting down and said, Well, I'd like to inform you that Mrs. B has been terminated effective immediately. With this being said, after your performance review and looking over your numbers, you are our top sales rep in this location and deserve nothing short of stellar remarks on your review. And you'll be getting those. I said, thank you, but may I ask a question? He spoke, sure, whatever. How do I apply for the newly available sales manager position? You sure do like to strike while the iron's hot, don't you? Mr. VP joked. I replied that, I do. And he promised to inform the location manager so that I could submit my application. He declined my thanks and answered, no, thank you. That was by far the most interesting performance evaluation I have ever seen in my 35 years of sales and sales management. I was ultimately not given a promotion, and soon after I ended up leaving my job, but Shortly after, they opted to not advance me and instead hired a man without any sales expertise to be our sales manager, which irritated me to the point that I ended up quitting. Another company offered me more money and our service department was terrible and couldn't deliver on what I was selling. This story focuses on a number of subjects related to the workplace, including competency, ethics, and the importance of expertise, a brilliant turn that highlights your intelligence is the use of technology, notably Google Location Services, to disprove accusations. Your annoyance at the company's decision to not promote you in spite of your outstanding sales performance just emphasizes how critical it is to recognize and honor achievement in the workplace. The contrast between the manager's unwanted advances and the backdrop of a professional setting highlights the need of acceptable behavior and respect in the workplace. The OP of the tale ultimately decides to quit the firm as a result of misalignment of values and priorities, and leaving the reader to reflect on the protagonist's journey from an exceptional salesperson trapped in a challenging performance evaluation. I'm always in favor of leaving a place that doesn't treat you the way you want to be treated, or doesn't respect you to the degree that you think you deserve. 
It's the best decision you can make, in my opinion. The next story is, Stupid neighbor keeps parking where he isn't allowed to. I'm going to teach him a lesson. A new family first disturbed our peaceful little neighborhood two years ago after relocating there. With the exception of the last two years, we've lived in this area for more than 20 years, and it has always been great. I enjoy living next door, aside from this family. This family is really awful. Even now, I'm, I'm not sure where to start. They continuously yell at each other. They're noisy, filthy, and downright annoying. They also throw late-night parties and just let their dog bark at all hours. They actually trained their Rottweiler to retrieve the older neighbor's paper, which is remarkable, but inaccurate. They hurl their dog's waste into neighboring yards. So much just... Ugh. Even worse, they took the cherished roses belonging to my 80-plus-year-old neighbor for themselves. That person, who? I could talk about a hundred different topics and how we've all handled them, but this past weekend was my own magnificent interpretation of it all. Oh, and we did try to engage them in conversation, invite them over, and show them kindness. But all we asked of them was that they be good neighbors. That's never once occurred. There isn't much parking in our neighborhood. The majority of these houses date back to the 1950s and have single-lane driveways. Parking is also scarce on the streets. A few blocks away is a busy street with a vibrant nightlife and well-liked eateries, so occasionally, particularly on the weekends, the streets might get crowded. With five vehicles and four drivers, this family can barely fit two in their driveway at once. They would frequently leave their automobiles parked in front of others' homes for days or even weeks at a time, occasionally leaving the driveways of those homes empty and all of their cars left on the street. With the exception of how and when they would do it, I kind of think that's not that big of a concern in and of itself. They planned everything out and will try to upset everyone as much as possible. This continued for several months. Thank you so much to everyone. After doing this for months without anyone taking action or letting them know how furious we all are, they started purposefully parking in such a way that it was difficult for us to exit our own driveways. In order to avoid hitting their car as I backed out of my own driveway, I needed my husband to lead me most mornings. They occasionally crammed my neighbor's car so closely against the curb that they were unable to even exit. Finally, a senior retired neighbor asks for advice at the local police station. They discovered a code or law that needed a certain amount of clearance from the driveway sides and other things. So when we got home one evening, every house in the neighborhood has recently been painted with this bright yellow curbing. My husband had to have his car taken away a few weeks ago after it broke down. So he starts chatting with this tow truck driver about these scumbag neighbors and their vehicles as he makes his way back. He advises my husband to phone the non-emergency number if these automobiles are parked unlawfully and to call him so that he can haul them at the owner's expense if they receive a penalty. It's against the law. They continue to communicate and even get together for a beer a few nights later because they both love the Blazers so much. Rip City, he's genuinely a kind guy. But we met a couple in our lovely city about a month ago, and it just so happens that the husband is an officer. So we had previously agreed to meet that Friday night, and I brought that scumbag neighbor, and they're parking to our meeting. So, if he has time during his shift, he promises to drive by and ticket everybody who is parked in the yellow zone. Great. When his buddies have time, he also asks them to check it out. Fantastic. We've been calling about their cars being parked illegally at this point virtually every day. But nothing was changing. He texts me that Saturday night to let me know that he penalized the three vehicles. Without a tow truck, because I missed that text, but with three tickets, I kind of assumed that they would move it. They failed to, and it was the same all week long on and off. This past Saturday, the adolescent son hosted a party, and every single one of their guests, as well as themselves, either blocked someone else's access completely or parked in the yellow of their neighbor's driveway. Evidently, that little brat told all of his buddies to block our driveways or obstruct our cars from getting out. So I texted our officer acquaintance, who replied that he would look into it and advised me to phone the non-emergency line. But I have bigger plans. I make a call to the tow truck driver and inform him that at least 15 vehicles are parked improperly, 
and are ready to be issued parking penalties for obstructing vehicles and driveways. He and I plot a little bit more after I inform him that we are pals with an officer. I think our plan is pretty sound. I give our cop friend a follow-up call and explain our strategy, noting that there will probably be many underage drinkers at this party. Even though I detest busting parties, I make an exception for these small a-holes, especially when they involve driving while intoxicated. The strategy is completed by him and me. Then this is how it all goes down. Officer and his three partners walk the entire neighborhood, issuing citations to each and every illegally parked vehicle. And in the meantime, our friend who drives a tow truck has gathered a group of his other drivers in the parking lot of the local supermarket. Inquiring anonymously about a potential underage party, my husband and I call in. Starting at the ends of our street, the tow truck drivers immediately seize the vehicles. Although there were a few alarms here and there, nobody in the party could hear them. So my spouse makes an anonymous call about a party for minors in our area as they get closer to the house. Our officer friend just so happens to be around, so he and his partner head over to the house to see how things are going. The lights go out, the music stops, and the house is silent as they knock on the door. The tow trucks arrive at this point and immediately begin towing the other five automobiles from in front of their house. I really wish I could see the children's faces inside since I know they are all struggling with this decision. Do they confront themselves outside for underage drinking and try to prevent their cars from being towed? Or do they sit back and take the $250 plus loss in silence? They had three cars that had been taken back on Sunday, and all three of them are now parked barely inside the lines. I'll declare this as a victory. On Sunday, my husband and a few other neighbors also installed some more cameras. The fact that all the lights and police on Saturday made them nervous is what caused them all to be so animated and vocal about the whole event. The story you provided here tells us of a case of clever revenge taken in response to local dissatisfaction. The story depicts the neighborhood's attempt to deal with the new neighbor's bad behavior. It's pretty clear that they have caused a great deal of disruption and turmoil amongst the neighborhood. A unique and enjoyable solution to the problem is this protagonist's resolve to act and involve the police officer and their friend tow truck driver. In the end, the neighborhood's ability to collaboratively handle the problem and the protagonist's drive to find a solution to the disturbing neighbors portrays a picture of a cohesive community unwilling to let disruptive conduct triumph. It's a tale of taking matters into one's own hands when necessary, and in the end, triumphing over a persistent annoyance. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment.